here. We have uh, a container with a piston. Uh, we're going to do a reaction of an acid with uh, zinc metal. And that reaction is going to give off heat and also uh, hydrogen gas. And so when the hydrogen gas leaves the closed system, it's able to lift the piston, okay? So it's doing work. Uh, and when it gives off heat, obviously it's, it's transferring energy to the surroundings and the form of heat. Uh, back in uh, chapter five, you also saw the terms uh, exothermic and endothermic. And these are uh, um, terms we, we apply to our delta H calculations. So, um, uh, when a system gives off heat, it's exothermic. And when a system absorbs heat, or, or when heat is absorbed from the surroundings, it's endothermic. Uh, all right. So enthalpy then is the heat that's involved in a chemical reaction. Oops. And we say that heat Q, Q is equal to the change in enthalpy for a system. So it's H, delta H, change in enthalpy. All right, so that's chapter five stuff. Uh, here's a, an example of a calculation that you should have seen before uh, in terms of enthalpy for a chemical reaction. Uh, so for a reaction, the enthalpy is delta H naught. Naught is, stands for standard condition, standard temperature and pressure, um, 25 degrees Celsius in one atmosphere. So delta H for a reaction is equal to the sum of the moles times delta H of formation for the products minus the sum of the moles times the delta H of formation for the reactants. Okay. So we can figure out delta H for the reaction that's shown uh, where we have methane combining with chlorine gas to form carbon tetrachloride and uh, hydrogen chloride gas. And uh, delta H of formation values are, are tabulated, so this is not something you should just know, uh, something you would go to the appendix in the book and look up or be given in a problem. Uh, so in order to find the delta H for a reaction, we're just gonna basically use our equation given. And so why don't you take a couple seconds, think about what all you need to do, given what you, you have here. Uh, think about actually write, doing the calculation, maybe start to write it out. Okay, so um, one of the key things to remember is you do have to include the stoichiometry. So that's where the moles are coming in. So uh, to find delta H for the reaction, we're gonna take, look at the products, their delta H is of formation, consider the stoichiometry, that's the moles, and then subtract that from what we get for the reactants. So that's going to look something like this. So delta H for the reaction. Okay, for our products we have uh, one mole of carbon tetrachloride, CCl4, times its delta H of formation, which is minus 135.4 kilojoules per mole. Notice that moles are going to cancel. Okay. Since we're doing the sum, we'll add the four moles of the HCl, which has a delta H of forma formation of minus 92.3 kilojoules per mole. Okay, so we're gonna sum all of this. Then we're gonna subtract 
what we get for the reactants. So one mole carbon, or excuse me, methane times minus 74.9 kilojoules per mole plus four moles uh, for the chlorine gas, uh, which has zero kilojoules per mole for its delta H of formation. So uh, for delta H, what you'll find is that uh, elements and molecules in their standard states, or elemental states, um, are going to have delta H of formation of zero, like chlorine gas. And I end up with a delta H of reaction of minus 429.7 kilojoules. It's okay. Remember, in these types of reactions, you need to multiply by the stoichiometry representing the moles in the reaction. Okay, so you end up with just kilojoules. Questions on that? All right, so that's your really fast summary of uh, chapter five, enthalpy. So let's start here thinking about uh, spontaneous processes. So in terms of, uh, in, the, in our chemical world, a spontaneous process is going to be something, a process that occurs without any outside help to make it happen. Um, the reverse of a spontaneous process this might be shocking, is a non-spontaneous process. So uh, if you have a reaction that occurs spontaneously in the forward direction, if you reverse that reaction, the reverse reaction will be non-spontaneous. That's what this is trying to tell you. The other important thing to note uh, is that uh, a spontaneous process can be fast or slow, okay? Spontaneity doesn't tell you anything about the rate for the reaction. Okay. Um, for something that's non-spontaneous, if we want to make that reaction happen, okay, we can either give it heat or energy and, and then force that reaction to take place. So, for instance, a really great example uh, is your cell phone battery, or any battery for that matter. Um, the spontaneous process is the reaction occurring in the battery that releases electrons and then charges your device. The non-spontaneous process is the reverse reaction, and we have to supply energy in order for that reverse reaction to take place. So when you're charging your phone, you're forcing the reverse reaction to take place. Okay. Um, so to determine whether a reaction uh, is spontaneous, um, we need to start to under, understand the second law of thermodynamics. Okay. So here's a, here's a great example of um, a spontaneous reaction that is really slow. Okay. So the formation of graphite from diamond uh, is spontaneous. So any diamonds you have, many, many, many years from now will soon be, will be graphite. Okay. It is not a very fast reaction. Okay. Uh, but it does take place. And um, given here, we have the, the structure for diamond and then for graphite. So it's mo graphite's more molecular, or excuse me, more um, sheet-like. So this is your graphite pencil. That's, the, that's what we're talking about. Diamond structure uh, is actually fairly ordered, despite what this picture kind of implies. Um, it is pretty ordered. Anyway, classic example of a spontaneous but incredibly slow reaction. Okay, so which direction will a reaction occur? Is it spontaneous? These are the types of questions um, that we're going to use the second law of thermodynamics for, or entropy. Um, enthalpy doesn't help us with these questions. Okay. So the second law of thermodynamics states that the total entropy of a system and its surroundings always increases for a spontaneous reaction. So another way of saying that is that if a reaction is spontaneous, the entropy is increasing. So what is entropy? 
I know we talked about it a little bit uh, when we were looking at solution formation at the very beginning of the semester. We couldn't actually explain why solutions form without our definition of entropy. Um, so entropy is basically a measurement of how dispersed the energy of a system is. People will say uh, a disordered state or something like that. It's an okay analogy to have in your head, but it's not really what entropy is. Um, so you have to be thinking about energy in terms of where it could be, I suppose. Uh, so a system with energy dispersed in many ways has a lot of entropy. Okay? I have a, the picture of the coffee and a cup, a saucer. So let's assume that the system is the coffee. The surroundings include the cup and the saucer and table and the air around it. Okay? Um, say our coffee is initially hot. And we know, because we are alive, that hot coffee gets cold, or a hot, hot beverage gets cold spontaneously. So that's a spontaneous process. And what's happening is the energy, the heat in the coffee is dispersing to more and more uh, places. Suppose. Um, the, the heat can transfer to the mug. You have a nice warm mug. It transfers through the bottom to the saucer. Uh, the air around the coffee gets hot. So now we've got an increase in entropy. Okay, so there's energy in more places than just in the coffee as it was initially. Does that make sense? Okay. So here's some classic examples of spontaneous processes. Rusting of iron. Okay, you uh, leave iron out in the open to the elements, air and water, it will form rust. Uh, heat flowing from hot to cold. Rock rolling downhill, you never see a rock spontaneously roll uphill. So these are all spontaneous processes. And my personal favorite, spontaneous human combustion. Those are legs. Hilarious. Um, <laughs> uh, the wood burning also is spontaneous. I just saw that picture. I think that's just the funniest thing. <laughs> Quick side note, I have one of my great, one of my really good friends from college. We were smart asses. And we had this speech class and the instructor was weird. Uh, and so we were we would give sarcastic speeches all the time. And she gave one on spontaneous human combustion. And every time she switched a slide on the PowerPoint, it would go spontaneous human combustion. <laughs> Very funny. So this is a little inside, a bit of an inside joke there. Now you don't know. Um, but if wood burning though is a spontaneous process. Uh, when you burn wood, you form carbon dioxide and water. You never see carbon dioxide and water. My needs are form wood. Take some energy to, to make wood. Okay. All right, so a few other ways of thinking about entropy. Um, it's a measure of molecular randomness, okay. a measure of disorder. And then this one uh, that we're going to talk about here with this figure, the number of arrangements available to a system in a given state. Okay. So let's look at this figure here. Um, this is a two-bulb flask that has only four molecules in it, A, B, C, and D. I know that's a little hard to see. But we're going to think about the number of ways that we can arrange these four molecules in this flask. So in the first arrangement, we're going to have um, all four molecules on the left side of the bulb. Okay? And there's only one way that those molecules can be, that we're going to say those molecules can be arranged. Now, we're going to ignore the fact that there are many spaces, uh, positions within the flask that they could be ordered. So like A right is given here, but it could be down here. We're going to ignore that. Okay. Um, so there's, there's a one arrangement. If we now allow one molecule to go to the right uh, bulb, we have four different possibilities for arrangement of molecules. So in the first one, A is on the right side, then we have B, then we have C, then we have D. Okay. So those are four different possible arrangements. In the third arrangement, we now have two molecules on one side, two on the other. And if you look, look through it, you can see that there are six different possibilities for that within that arrangement. 
These different possibilities we refer to as microstates. You may, in terms of, instead of the word arrangement, you may also see state, state and microstate. And then you can see as we go back down uh, the, t the table, one molecule on the left, three on the right, has the same number of possible microstates as arrangement two, and then four on the right, none on the left, one possible, one possible microstate. So um, what this is saying is that the, uh, I want to make sure I say this correctly. So this, the state that is going to be preferred or spontaneous is going to be the arrangement that has the highest probability of happening. So if we were to sum up uh, the, num the number of microstates possible for these arrangements, uh, we would find that this arrangement three has the highest number of, uh, highest probability of occurring. Okay? Uh, and so that's going to be the one that, that is spontaneous. Does that make sense? So entropy can also be thought of um, in terms of probability. It does get a little bit uh, more confusing when we think about something like rusting. You know, having a probability for the state and rusting, it's a lot more complicated to start thinking about. But, but basically to summarize is that um, Nature spontaneously proceeds towards the state with the highest probability. Make sense? <laughs> Microstates are a little hard to, to think about conceptually, uh, especially on a much larger scale than four molecules and two, uh, two ball flats. But, it, but the idea is that uh, if you have more possibilities for atoms or molecules or heat or uh, energy to go, that is going to have a greater uh, probability and a higher uh, and more likely to be the spontaneous process. So we can think about uh, entropy in terms of phase changes. Um, we're going to see that entropy is going to increase when we go from a solid to a liquid. It's also going to e increase when we go from a liquid to a gas. And of course, it increases when you go from a solid to a gas. And we can think about this in terms of structure. Um, so let's think about water in the solid state, so ice. Okay? We're going to have a nice arrangement, a very ordered structure. And those molecules in the in structure, they move a little bit, but not a lot, right? There's no translational motion. They're not uh, switching places with other molecules. They're in a place. They might interact a little bit, have vibrations within their bonds, but they're not uh, moving around as they do uh, in liquid water. So of course, liquid water, as we know, is less ordered. But compared to the gas phase, those molecules are still relatively close together. Um, once we get to the gas phase, now we're only even showing three molecules in this box. And basically what that's telling you is that the molecules are so far apart that we just can't show all of the others. And so when we have this increase in volume that's required to house the same number of molecules, there's greater places, greater, num greater number of microstates for those molecules to be in. And so that means that entropy has increased. Okay. Um, so if we look at this in terms of a plot of standard enthalpy on our y-axis and temperature uh, on Kelvin on our x-axis, uh, we, can, we can give a get a picture of how entropy is changing as we go from a solid to a liquid to a gas. Uh, this is for bromine, okay, so 
Um, what we'll see uh, at zero Kelvin, that's going to be a special case. We're going to get to that in a minute. But what we, we see is that the entropy increases within a phase, um, but then as we, add, as we increase the temperature, but then as a phase transition occurs, there's a sharp increase in entropy at a given temperature. Okay, and this is the transition uh, where we're going from a solid, in this case, to a liquid. And then again, within the liquid, there's a, a gradual increase in entropy as the uh, liquid is heated up. And then another sharp increase um, when we enter the gas phase. And we can think about this in terms of kinetic energy. Um, uh, because we can even think, we can even see that in the gas phase, as the temperature increases, the entropy increases slightly. And so, when we have greater, uh, greater energy, greater amount of heat, um, uh, molecules are moving around faster. So the kinet kinetic energy has increased, and that again increases the entropy. Figure. We'll see that. You know, if we were able to zoom in there, as the temperature approaches zero, our entropy is approaching zero. Can we ever actually achieve zero entropy? Should I say not yet or no? I don't know, but no, not yet. So I've stuck this slide in here. Um, I think there might be a homework question similar to what, to talk to thinking about phase changes and the uh, entropy that. Uh, takes place within a phase change. So we're going to give the, the symbol, uh, we're going to give entropy the symbol S. So an entropy change is delta S. Uh, so given, or at a given phase change, the change in entropy is going to be given by the delta H for that phase change over the temperature. So for um, fusion, or going from a solid to a liquid, we're going to have delta S is equal to delta H of fusion over T temperature in Kelvin. So I'll put Kelvin here. Um, delta H is usually going to be given in joules per mole. But oftentimes, um, I'm sorry, usually it's given in kilojoules per mole because it's such a large value. We'll often report entropy in joules per mole, so you're going to have to watch that in terms of calculations. That's going to be true um, for most of this chapter. Watch your kilojoules and your joules and all of that. Okay. Uh, and then for going from the liquid phase to the gas phase, it's delta H of vaporization over the temperature in Kelvin. So uh, you may see a question like this, what is the entropy change when one mole of carbon tetrachloride goes from liquid to gas at the normal boiling point? And you would be given the fact that delta H of vaporization is 32 kilojoules per mole and the boiling point is 350 Kelvin. Okay, again, you need to have Kelvin in kilojoules per mole. Um, so we can calculate the entropy change, given the equation at the top of the slide, uh, delta S, oops, delta S is equal to delta H of vaporization over the temperature, and keep in mind uh, our delta H is in kilojoules. Excuse, yeah, yeah, it's in kilojoules per mole, so 32 kilojoules. I'm going to convert that to joules. That's 32,000 joules. And we also need to keep get rid of the moles. Okay, so we said one mole of gas. So we have joules per mole for the delta H. Now one mole of gas, and our temperature was 350 Kelvin. And so when you calculate this out, We'll get 91 joules per Kelvin for our entropy change. Okay. Relatively simple calculation, but it's trying to, to express the fact that entropy is increasing, so it's a positive value. We're going to talk about this in a little bit more detail. When, when the change in entropy is positive, that means that the reaction, uh, there's an increase in the entropy, nothing to do there. 
Um, and uh, it's about 91 joules per I, uh, joules per Kelvin. I know that that's sort of an abstract number, but that's okay. But notice the positive value. That's good. Okay, so we saw this figure uh, in chapter 13, I believe it was, our solutions chapter. We were able to explain why solutions form uh, during an exothermic process. Um, we, when, we, when we mix the solution, the, the enthalpy uh, was great enough that it overcame any energy required to separate solute and solvent. Remember this stuff? So then we came across an issue, though, when the delta H, the enthalpy of mixing, was small relative to the delta H of the solute and the delta H of the solvent. Okay. So we had to say that entropy, and just leave it at that, basically, was why the solution still formed. Okay. So where were we? we? We can look at this in a little bit more detail now. And we need to consider again our microstates. So why do substances have a natural tendency to mix? It's because of the increase in, well, there are the other factors that we talked about, delta H of solute and delta H of solvent have to be agreeable, but the, the microstates are the real, the other reason, entro uh, entropically speaking, in terms of entropy. Um, so when substances mix, there are more microstates available. So more, more microstates available in solution than separate. And so if we look at our figure here, we're gonna try to dissolve sodium chloride in water. Okay, if we just think about sodium chloride salt on its own, highly ordered structure, okay, the atoms are, uh, are basically just there with their London dispersion forces and those interactions uh, of ions. Um, Water, we know that's going to uh, have some fluid motion, but not a large amount of space, but more, than, more so than solid uh, water or ice. Now, when we mix the two, and the sodium ions and the chloride ions become dispersed throughout the water, there's an increased number of places for those, atom, or, excuse me, for those ions to be. So they have an increased number of microstate possibilities. And that gives us gives rise to an increase in entropy and therefore is a spontaneous process. Okay. You, the other way you can think about it is there's just more volume. Uh, more volume or more places for the molecules to be in or atoms or ions. Make sense? Sort of. A, that's a very quick rundown, but it, it's really all about these microstates. Okay. So uh, there are essentially four factors that affect the number of possible microstates in a given system. The first one is temperature and kinetic energy. If you think about a gas at a high temperature, using our kinetic molecular theory, you know that the particles are moving around relatively quickly, speedily, uh, bouncing off of walls all over the place. If we cool that, temper or cool that gas down, molecules are moving slower, um, and it, that decreases the kinetic energy, which decreases the entropy of the system. The available, available volume, okay, so if we have a larger volume available, there's more microstates that are possible, and so the entropy has increased. Uh, the number of independently moving particles, uh, um, if we have more particles, 
that are moving around, you're gonna have a greater sense of entropy. And this one's a good one. You're gonna see this uh, in a couple of, couple many uh, practice problems. Um, the number of reactants and products, and this is in the gas phase in particular. So if a reaction occurs and you see an increase in the number of gas molecules that are produced during that reaction, the entropy will increase, okay? So in the first reaction here, we have uh, three gas molecules reacting and forming two uh, molecules. And so we see, actually see a decrease in the entropy. And in the second reaction, we have two molecules reacting to form three. So we see an increase in entropy. We're going to come back to this idea in a one slide, I believe. But I want to uh, show you a little bit, a little bit of history on, very brief history on how uh, entropy was uh, came about. So Ludwig uh, Boltzmann. Um, this is his uh, essentially his grave. Um, in Vienna, Austria. Uh, on his grave, he has the uh, equation that shows how entropy and the number of microstates are related. And that's given here. Uh, entropy S equals K, that's the Boltzmann constant, yes, it's named after him, uh, times the natural log of W, where W is the number of microstates. And so essentially what this uh, equation says is that entropy increases as the number of microstates increases. <coughs> and what do you end up with? Zero, right? And so your entropy equals zero. So that's what that equation is. So that brings us to our third law of thermodynamics. So um, what this says is that a substance that is uh, perfectly crystalline at zero Kelvin has an entropy of zero. And if we go back a couple slides to our phase chain, so uh, when there's perfect order at zero Kelvin, there's no thermal motion, no vibration, no rotation, no translation, nothing. And there's only one microstate available. Okay. So if you have the natural log of you, that's where the third law of dynamics comes from. Now, we also need to have, we also use the third law of dy uh, thermodynamics as sort of a baseline uh, for uh, standard molar excuse me, standard molar entropies. So S. Um, so standard enthalpies. Uh, our values relative to zero Kelvin, uh, but that should say entropies. Okay, so standard entropies are values relative to zero. So relative to that place where there's no movement, there's only one microstate. One thing, okay. We do have some trends uh, in standard molar entropies. So what we actually are looking at, um, though, when we're talking about standard entropy uh, is at 25 degrees Celsius, not actually at zero. Okay. That's something to note. Um, and we saw this with our phase change plot. The entropy for a gas is greater than that for a liquid, which is greater than that for a solid. Uh, another interesting thing here is that the entropy increases with increasing molar mass. Why do you think that is? Think about just a, just a single atom, okay, or a single element. When we increase uh, the, its mass, what's happening? What are we adding? Protons and neutrons and electrons, right? So or let's just think about the electrons, even. Um, when we have more electrons, we need to have more orbitals. Remember the orbitals? We have more orbitals, there's more places for those electrons to be, and so there's more microstates that are available. Right? If you want to think about it in terms of a molecule, um, there's more vibration that can take place. Right? Uh, uh, okay, and the other thing we'll see is that the entropy increases 
with an increasing number of atoms in the substance. Um, so you could think about H2O versus H2O2. H2O2 would have a greater en ent entropy uh, than H2O. Questions on that? Okay. All right, so the way we calculated enthalpies for a reaction is the same way we're going to calculate entropies for a reaction. So delta S for a reaction, let's put that in there going to be equal to the sum of the moles of the entropy for the products minus the sum of the moles of the entropy for the reactants. And uh, if we see a positive change in entropy, we see an increase in entropy, negative decrease in entropy. No funny business with positive and minus. You should be able to predict the sign of delta S based on uh, these three parameters that are given. So the entropy, the change in entropy will be positive when a molecule is broken into two or more smaller molecules. Uh, when a reaction has more moles of gas on the product side than on the reactant side, so I showed you that. Or when a solid changes to a liquid, a liquid to a gas, or a solid to a gas. Okay, we talked about those two things. Again, all of these have an increase in microstates available. Okay, and that's going to be the reasoning behind our change, our positive change in entropy. All right, so take a minute, predict whether entropy will increase or decrease for th these three different reactions. And you can talk to your neighbor. All right. What about for the first reaction? Was entropy going to increase or decrease? Increase. We have two moles of gas on the reactant side. We have three moles of gas on the product side. We know that if we increase the number of moles of gas, the entropy will increase. What about for the second reaction? Decrease. Everyone agree? Yeah. So we have three moles of gas um, on the reactant side. Uh, we have two moles of gas on the product side. And so, so we should see a decrease in the entropy for this reaction. And what about the last one? Decrease. We're going to go from a gas to a solid, so we'll see a, a decrease in the entropy. Questions on those? Okay. So again, I'll have you work on this um, problem. I believe uh, if you did, if you weren't given values of delta S, uh, appendix C in your book has these. I'm sure there's a link in the homework. Uh, so let's calculate the entropy change for the reaction. 2SO3 forming 2SO2 plus O2. You're given uh, values of entropy. 
standard anyway. So I'll have you work on that for a bit. All right, so it's very similar to our delta H calculation. So we're going to do our products times uh, entropy times the moles. So we'll have two moles of uh, SO2 times the 241 joules per mole Kelvin, or excuse me, 248.1. Notice that moles are going to cancel, and we should be left with joules per Kelvin for our entropy. Other thing to note here is that, so oxygen, O2, is its elemental form, does not have a value of zero, like, like, the, entro, or excuse me, like the enthalpy did. So products minus the reactants, two moles times 256.7, what'd you guys get? Get a positive value or a negative value? Positive. Does that make sense? Yeah. Should see a positive value because we're increasing the number of moles of gas. And I got 187.8 joules per Kelvin. Okay. Questions on this type of problem? Relatively straightforward, I hope. <laughs> All right, so now we're going to start looking at another term. Uh, and this is what's called free energy. So what free energy essentially means is the energy that's available to do work. Uh, you may also see the term Gibbs free energy. Um, and this will help us decide if a process is spontaneous. So the Gibbs free energy is given by the equation delta G equals delta H minus T delta S. So if we know our enthalpy and our entropy at a given temperature, we can predict if a reaction is spontaneous. So for a given reaction, if delta G is negative, the reaction is spontaneous as written. If delta G is positive, the reaction is non-spontaneous as written. But that also means that the reverse reaction would be spontaneous. Right. And if delta G is zero, what do you think that means? Reversible? Equilibrium. Yeah, yeah. If delta G is zero and we're at equilibrium, and I made a note here that this is usually means plus or minus, less than plus or minus 10 kilojoules. That's nearly equilibrium, but you don't need to worry about that. Okay, so when we have substances <coughs> in their standard states, um, we'll use the delta G naught equals delta H minus T delta S. And for these, uh, we can use um, tabulated values of delta H and delta S.
You can also find tabulated values for the Gibbs energy for a per, uh, particular uh, compound. Um, so there's actually two ways to calculate the Gibbs free energy, and you should be able to use both and know when it's appropriate to use which calculation. So uh, if you're only given values of delta H and uh, entropy, then you can figure out delta H for the reaction, delta S for the reaction, and use the equation uh, given here with delta G. But if you have tabulated data for the Gibbs energy uh, of formation, delta G sub F, so that'll be for a specific reactant or product, then you can use the same sort of uh, formula we've been using for all of our other thermodynamic properties. Uh, moles times the Gibbs free energy of the products minus moles times the Gibbs free energy of the reactants. Sum them up. Okay. We're doing good today. Um, so, uh, delta G can tell us a number of things. Um, how useful a reaction might be to do work, okay? Only spontaneous reactions are gonna be able to do work. So the spontaneous process, the spontaneous reaction that's taking place in your cell phone battery, that's doing work, it's powering your phone. Right? We also have a term that we call the maximum possible, possible useful work. Um, this is what we'll calculate when we're using delta G. This is never an actually achievable value um, because uh, we always will lose uh, heat or energy to something, okay? It's a hypothetical value. Um, we'll refer to maximum work as delta G, okay? Free energy to do, free to do useful work. And that's gotta be at constant temperature and pressure, by the way, okay. So uh, this figure is going to allow us to think about how the free energy is changing during a reaction, how the available energy to do work is changing during a reaction. On our y-axis, we have G, the Gibbs free energy, and on our x-axis, we have products, excuse me, progress of reaction. Uh, in the left-hand corner, we'll have our reactants, and then we'll go on to form our products in the right-hand corner. And as you'll see, um, while we're at our products, uh, for a spontaneous reaction, okay, if we're starting at our products, we'll see that delta G, or G is decreasing, which means delta G is negative. Okay. And so that's a spontaneous process. And you can imagine here, a ball rolling down the hill. Okay, it's going to go until it gets to the bottom. Uh, and that's our equilibrium. That's when delta G equals zero. Okay. okay, so for a given reaction, the other thing that you can get from this figure is the delta G for the reaction. Uh, and here, the, en the delta G, the Gibbs free energy um, for the products is less than that for the reactants. So what's the sign of delta G? It's gotta be negative, right? Okay. Let's say we're at equilibrium, so we're at the bottom of the hill and we want to produce more products. We know at equilibrium we're gonna have a mixture of reactants and products. Um, that mixture is dependent on where we are, where equilibrium lies along this progress of reaction. Here it looks like we're a bit product favored. But if we wanted to form more products, notice that we'd have an uphill battle. Right? So we'd have to spend some energy somehow uh, in order to actually produce more products. Okay, more, I like this topic, so we're gonna talk about this more um, next time as well. Um, there will be a fun demo next time, FYI. Tell your friends. The next 
Uh, we'll, we'll, we'll talk about